Andrew Holmes, thank you very much indeed for coming back on Evolution Soup. You are a paleoanthropologist and PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Department of Anthropology, and your main interest is in the evolutionary history of ancient primates from millions of years ago. So uh, how have things been going since our last interview? What have you been working on? Oh, pretty good. Uh, as always, I'm, I'm working on you know understanding the evolutionary history of the Pliopus, so that's yep. been going pretty good. I'm just uh, actually writing up uh, my big paper that looks at the does a phylogenetic analysis of all the plaques we've been found. So hopefully, wow. to get that out uh, sometime early next year. Dude, that sounds like a big old work. Yeah, it's been a few years I've been working on it. So. Well, on our last interview, we talked about ancient monkeys and apes and their relation to human evolution. But today, we're going to be focusing on one particular genus, the perfectly named Gigantopithecus which means, of course, giant ape, the largest primate that ever lived, now extinct, but still hugely fascinating to people because of its size and the mystery surrounding it. So I guess a, a good place to start is just how giant was Gigantopithecus? Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, the estimates range, you know, there, there's a variation in the range of the estimates, but uh, at, the, at the higher end, some people think he was about, if he was to stand upright, would have been about 10 feet tall and weigh over 1,000 pounds. Um, and then there's a, on the smaller side of the estimate, people say maybe about seven feet and weighing, um, you know, about 600 pounds or so. So just to put that in perspective, um, even on the smaller end, that'd be the biggest primate we've ever seen. The, yeah. like, you know, the big adult male gorilla, uh, you know, they, they tend to weigh about, you know, four or 500 pounds, right? Um, so if we go with the high end of that estimate, Gigantopithecus is, is double a gorilla, essentially. Wow. No. Uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the backstory behind Gigantopithecus, when and where its fossils were first found, because that's quite an interesting story in itself, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it really is. It really starts in uh, in Hong Kong in about 1935 uh, with this paleontologist named uh, Ralph von Koningswald. Now he's a German-born paleontologist who was working in the area. He was actually working in Indonesia in the island of Java as part of um, this big research project looking for Homo erectus fossils. And uh, during his time working there with all these researchers, he learned it's a really good idea to go check out what were called uh, Chinese pharmacies or Chinese apothecaries. Because um, what you'd find in these places uh, were fossils. People would collect fossils, like farmers would bring them to these, uh, to these apothecaries, and then they'd be ground down into fine powders and then made into different forms of medicine and stuff like that, right? So von Koningswald knew this through the uh, through the you know working on the Homo erectus stuff, and so he was in Hong Kong and he was checking out one of these pharmacies, and he sees this just really massive tooth, and instantly he recognizes this is an ape tooth because ape teeth have some really distinctive uh, things about their shape. They have this thing called the Y five pattern that you can see. It's just how the different cusps are oriented to to each other and the amount okay. of cusps on the, on the lower molars, right? Right. So he sees that in his tooth, and he's like, I've never seen an ape tooth this big. This is obviously an ape tooth. He takes this tooth, and on the basis of one tooth, he publishes a paper saying that there's this species called Gigantopithecus, right? Hmm. And that, that's on one, uh, just on one singular tooth here. You can see this is, this is a Gigantopithecus molar right there. There are ones that are bigger, um, but that's about the size of it. Um, get a few more over here, just some plates. These are casts, of course. So give you an idea, they're just really they massive. Yeah, they're massive. <laughs> so uh, then he spends the next like three or four years going around checking out all these different uh, pharmacies, seeing if he can gather more teeth. He, he, you know, he, he does get a few more, gets like three or four more. So so he kind of builds in more and more of a case that there's this thing called Gigantopithecus. But you know, some people were a little bit skeptical about. Um, but then what happens is uh, you know World War II breaks out and uh, He's living in Java, and he's you know he's got a feeling that things aren't really going to go too well because the Japanese, um, you know, eventually they, they they invade Java. But before they did that, he was smart enough. He took all his gigantic pithecus teeth and he put them in a milk bottle, 
and uh, he, he goes to his friend's backyard, digs a hole, and, and puts the milk bottle in, in, in the ground, covers it up. Um, shortly thereafter, the Japanese did invade uh, Java, and von Konenswald is taken uh, prisoner, and he spends the remainder of uh, World War II in a, in a Japanese internment camp. Um, and luckily, uh, he goes back, he's released after the war, goes back, finds those teeth, and they're still there. Pretty interesting story, because at the same time in World War II, we did lose a lot of Homo erectus fossils. That were Peking kind of Man, lost on us. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly, exactly, yep. Gosh, yeah, the good old World War II is responsible for a lot of losses and, and, and in more ways than one. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the early days of the study of Gigantopithecus, it was postulated that it was related to Australopithecus, a genus of homonyms that is thought to be ancestral to modern humans. But that isn't necessarily the prevailing theory, is it? Um, no, not these days. But at the time, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the von Koningswald story again here. Because um, before von Koningswald buried the teeth, he allowed uh, another researcher named uh, Weidenreich to uh, make some some casts of these fossils. And, and, and it, it, Weidenreich was also responsible for making the castle, the casts of the um, Homo erectus Peking man fossils that were lost during World War II. So Weidenreich's really important for preserving some of this stuff. But uh, Weidenreich had a very different idea about what these fossils represented. Um, he takes the cast, he goes back to the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York, and he begins to put out some publications on them. Now, he was under the impression that uh, von Koningswald had made a big mistake, that these weren't ape teeth at all. And he thought they really represented a, hu a period in human prehistory in which our uh, ancestors went through this period of gigantism. Huh. And that actually became a fairly well-accepted idea for the time. Uh, von Kongswold, as I said, he gets later released from um, from the Japanese internment camp, and he's like, no, no, that's th th these guys are clearly apes. But it remains a, an idea of debate, and with you know all debates in paleontology, the best way to solve them is to find more fossils, right? Absolutely. So, um, but this is we're getting into the 1950s now, and hmm. and these fossils are not found. Uh, you know, where von Kahn and were found, they were actually found in China. At that time, China had just um, created what's called the uh, Institute of Vertebrate uh, Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. It was founded in the early 1950s. And uh, so it was, at, at that point, it wasn't Western researchers who were doing the research. It was actually uh, Chinese researchers that set out to go find more evidence of these Gigantopithecus. In particular, uh, there's, there's two researchers Xia Lan Po and uh, Pei Wen Xiong. Um, so basically, they went around and they checked out uh, the warehouses that were supplying the dragon bone fossils for, for these Chinese pharmacies. And what they found is there's a really relatively large collection they found in um, uh, Nanning, uh, which is in Guangxi province. Um, and so they split into two teams at this point. Uh, Xia went south to uh, Tassin County um, and there he found this, uh, this elderly woman who had this really nice collection of fossils and she directs them to this cave site and so Ooh. they head out and they go to this cave site and uh, there he goes he finds the first in situ fossil of a Gigantopithecus tooth so now we're not just finding them in the, in the, in the medicine shops but actually in the ground and so that's, that's a real big thing because it's going to allow us to give us start to get a little bit better dates on these on these fossils because there was you know all the what that uh, von Konswell could do is speculate by like the other fossils that he found in the medicine shops alongside these um meanwhile hey the other uh, researcher he went north and uh, he ends up in a place called uh, li chong and that's where he makes some really big discoveries because he's not he, he finds actual mandibles uh not just the teeth and when people begin to see the mandibles and how big they are and the morphology of them, the idea that these represent a human ancestor really s starts to fall apart more and more. And the mandible, for those who don't know, is the jawbone, the low, lower lower jaw. Yeah, it's right here. Here's Gigantopithecus. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is one of the mandibles that he found. Just uh, just put that in context here. I'll That's show horrifying. you. This is, uh, so this is, this is um, like a mandible from a gorilla, right? And so. Which is this. terrifying enough, but that is, it yeah. Just, like, look, look at the, like the depth of the mandible, how it's like, you know, 
twice as big as the gorilla going up that way. It's pretty massive. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to, in terms of where, what, what we think about the evolutionary relationship of Gigantopithecus um, mm -hmm. relative to, to other extent and extinct taxa today, um, there's actually some new research that came out on this uh, just just this week, which is kind of neat. But yeah. it, what, what became the consensus opinion, essentially, is that Gigantopithecus is um, from a subfamily of, uh, of apes that we call the Pongines. So in the Pongines, where they're a really diverse uh, group back in the, uh, in the Miocene, you have all these different uh, Asian apes like uh, Shiva Pithecus, Ankara Pithecus, Indo Pithecus, and even uh, modern day orangutans are part of the Pongine group. And uh, yeah, just to tell you a little bit about this new research that just, uh, just came out, um, published on November 13th. So yeah, just yesterday. Um, oh and this is this is pretty cutting edge for a number of reasons is what they were able to do is they took some uh they took a fossil um one of the gigantopithecus uh, fossils from vietnam that dates to about 1.9 million years and they were able to actually extract protein sequences from the teeth um and so what's really cool about that is like uh that's about five times older than any other protein sequences that have ever been extracted from a mammalian uh, animal before so and they were they're were, they're able to kind of reconstruct not not the genome but we call the proteome so they kind of look at the protein structures and and uh, they compare that to a number of different things and, and one thing that their study seems to suggest is that yeah these gigantopithecus is part of the pongine group and they probably shared an ancestor with uh, orangutans about 10 to 12 million years ago so right. Yeah, it just became like even more certain, you know, what people have been saying for years, these guys are a pongine, and now we just have another line of evidence that really seems to support that. And this protein cool. analysis is what they did recently with the Denisovans, I think? Uh, yeah, I think there has been some of that. I, I'm not super familiar with that research, so I can't, uh, can't really elaborate on those guys too much. But dude, it seems to be a, a kind of growing field these days because, you know, of the limitations of fossils, we, we're not able to find... Um, you know, extract DNA from them, but we are able to get proteins. So that's really cool. Well, we don't have that many fossil bones, as you said, of Gigantopithecus, mostly teeth, mandibles, etc., as you said. So we must be able to tell what these primates ate through the study of these teeth, I'm presuming. Is that right? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's exactly right. There's actually been quite a bit of research into the uh, diet of uh, Gigantopithecus. Because you say it's only teeth and mandibles. There are no other bones. There's no skeletal bones. There's no cranial bones. Just teeth and mandibles. But even even with that, you know, we can just look at the morphology of the teeth to begin with. And the morphology, as you said, this guy's got like just a really, really deep mandible here. And uh, But the molars are relatively low crowned and they're kind of flat. Um, you know, the enamel on these molars is, is really thick. Um, so this kind of shows us these teeth were able to do some kind of heavy grinding. Now, the premolars are kind of interesting because, you know, they look a little bit more like molars in some ways. Hmm. They're kind of molarized ones. And then the canines, they're not, you know, they're not really big and sharp. Like uh, if you look at uh, this, this gorilla over here, he's got these big, sharp, protruding canines. Hmm. Gigantopithecus isn't really quite like that. Um, and then the, the teeth, the, the, the front teeth, the incisors, actually do kind of look a little bit like a gorilla. They're kind of pig-like. But when you take the morphology of the, of the posterior teeth and the anterior teeth and kind of put it together, it kind of tells you well, what we think we have here is this kind of cutting apparatus in the front that would have like sheared things off and then some big molars in the back for grinding, grinding it down. So, you know, just based on the morphology that led researchers to the conclusion that these guys were, you know, herbivores, that they were eating things like leaves and grasses and, um, and maybe even bamboo. And this is where some of the research kind of picks up here in the bamboo stuff. Um, there's a researcher named uh, Wu Ranking. Uh, he took a look at all the Gigantopithecus teeth from China, and he found there's an extremely high rate of cavities in their teeth. So about 11% of all Gigantopithecus uh, fossils would have cavities in their teeth, which is really, really quite high for an ape. But it's actually pretty much on par for the rate of cavities that you find in a giant panda, right? As we all know, that's what giant pandas eat, you know, just bamboo pretty much. Right. Um, yeah, and they also have like a really high rate of uh, hypoplasia, 
in their teeth. And so what hypoplasia is essentially this kind of this pitting in the tooth enamel that indicates periods of arrested development. And so that ties in with the kind of bamboo idea because there's these periods of like mass die off of bamboo. And so if these guys were eating a lot of bamboo and then all of a sudden, you know, there's no bamboo to be found, that's going to really stunt their, their growth. And they kind of have these kind of stunted growth periods in the, that seem to be represented by the hypoplasia in their teeth. Um, so if that wasn't enough, you know, the, the, it, it keeps on continuing, um, particularly with, uh, you know, one researcher who's been really big in the field of gigantopithecus is, is Russell Chohan. And he took a look at the microware. So, you know, looking at the microscopic little scratches and, and pits and stuff like this. And he says, yeah, the teeth that we have here are really, the, the scratches, the microware, all, it's all very consistent with an animal that has a heavy fibrous diet. And then, um, they also look, he also looked at the, uh, the phytoliths. So phytoliths are like these microscopic little pieces of silica that are found in plant. And you're able to kind of look at them and get an idea of what they might have came from. They're actually, uh, he looked at the gigantopithecus teeth and found that there's phytoliths attached to them. And they found a, a mix of different phytoliths. Some were very long and needle-like, and those are really similar to the ones that we find in bamboo. And then others were kind of conical shaped or I think even described as hat shaped. Um, and that seems to suggest that maybe there's some fruit components. So, you know, what we have here is we see this primate with a, you know, a diet that's probably primarily uh, grasses, bamboo, things like that. And then, you know, a small fruit component as well. Um, and, and the kind of cool thing about all this diet stuff is, you know, it's not just telling us about diet. It's also telling us a bit about the behavior because we have this really big herbivore. And we know about a little bit about big herbivores. They tend to be slow moving. They basically kind of go to one place. They eat everything around. Then they kind of saunter off into the next place, sit down, go around eating everything in that neighborhood. Um, so a lot of the food that they eat has a low nutritional value as well. So they're just kind of like, long, you know, moseying along, eating this low nutritional value food, but eating massive amounts of it. It's probably making yeah. them a bit, a bit more sluggish as well. So, you know, that's, that's essentially what we kind of know about their, their diet and, and, and where that diet begins to tell us a little bit of, about behavior. Do we know anything about those canines? You said they're quite small, uh, so they wouldn't use them for, for instance, display. Oh, uh, well, they, they might. I mean, there's, you know, there's still a bit of sexual dimorphism between um, males and females, you know. So the, the females are, you know, are smaller. I think this one right here, uh, this would be, you know, this would be a female compared to the male here. So you can see they're, they're a bit smaller. Wow. Um, so, you know, there's probably some component to that. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's just not extreme as what we see in... Uh, you know, in, in gorillas and chimpanzees today. Yeah. Right. So, in terms of geography, how widespread was Gigantopithecus, and uh, when did it live, as well? Uh, well? Yeah, that's another good question because it really depends on what you consider to be Gigantopithecus. Because all this time, I've been talking about this this one species we call Gigantopithecus black eye, um, which actually is named after uh, von Kongswald named it. When he named it, he named it after his friend Davidson Black who was a uh, researcher uh, from the University of Toronto, actually. So the original Gigantopithecus is named after a Canadian. Um, but uh, So that's Gigantopithecus black eye. That's the really big one. And we, and we find those at fossil sites in uh, China and Vietnam. And they go from about 2 million years to about 300,000 years ago, thereabouts. Um, but there's actually some other stuff in India. Um, and that was actually found before the von Koningswald discoveries in 1935. It goes all the way back to 1915 with uh, the paleontologist Guy Pilgrim. He finds this uh, relatively large tooth there, and he gives it the name uh, Dry Dryopithecus giganteus. Um, but that was like back in 1915, and like everybody was calling everything Dryopithecus back then. Like you find any sort of ape, it's Dryopithecus. It was becoming a bit of a waste bin taxon, I think. Um, so by the 1950s, it kind of becomes obvious, like this, this one genus, Dryopithecus, really can't account for all the range of variation and different kinds of fossils in it. And so then, uh, you know, re-enter von Kongswald get, again to the picture. He looks at the teeth and he says, uh, yeah, this isn't really Dryopithecus. We should call it something new. And he suggests the name Indiopithecus. Um, and then... A few years later, in the 1960s, um, Elwin Simmons, who's working in the region of India and Pakistan, 
uh, he comes along and uh, he finds he finds this mandible. I think a farmer brought it to him or something. And it's a really big mandible again. Um, and so he suggests that this is related to that Dryopithecus giganteus thing, the Indiopithecus giganopithecus. But he goes a bit further and says, no, this is actually another species of Giganopithecus. And so this one be called, becomes um, Gig Giganopithecus uh, giganteus, which is kind of funny that it has that name because it's actually smaller. It's actually <laughs> uh, the smaller of the species, and it's both the size of a, a gorilla. So it's still a really big ape, you know, but it's just not as big as Giganopithecus. Um, but, you know, there, there's some problems with this, and people have argued that that maybe those india pakistan ones are really from the same gene and first of all we have like a seven million gap between them because the india pakistan mm. stuff is much 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 older you know it's going back uh to about i think about nine million years so we have this nine million year fossil gap and you know the morphology isn't exactly the same we're mostly making this conclusion on on an aspect of size which isn't always you know the most definitive way to go about things. So, um, you know, a lot of people actually now refer to that India and Pakistan stuff as Indiopithecus, not as Gigantopithecus anymore. So, um, so, you know, if we stick with the strict Gigantopithecus black eye, then we're saying, you know, India, or sorry, not India, but uh, China and Vietnam from about 2 million years ago to about 300,000 years ago. Well, Andrew, as you said, these primates lived from about Two million years ago to around 300,000 years ago. So they must have shared the planet with at least one hominid species. Yeah, actually, they uh, they shared it with quite a few. Um, they, if we're talking that time period of two million years ago to about 300,000 years ago, we have uh, Homo erectus, we got Homo heidelbergensis, we have the Denisovans, we have Neanderthals, and really even at the cusp, at the end of that, we have the emergence of Homo sapiens. Um, mm. Now, most of these hominins are confined to Europe and Africa at this time, and the only hominin species that really show geographical and temporal overlap uh, is Homo erectus. Um, so we know Homo erectus was in the same area, and it was, you know, it was, uh, around the same time. And there's actually three different cave sites uh, in Vietnam where they found Gigantopithecus fossils and Homo erectus fossils in the same, um, you know, in the same stratigraphy. So we can say, yeah, we do know that they were. Uh, living, you know, side by side in some instances. So what do we know about why they went extinct? Can we blame it on climate change or perhaps Homo erectus hunting them or, or, or both? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is we know so little about what Gigantopithecus was like when it was alive. It's kind of even more difficult in some ways to speculate on how they went extinct. But we can say uh, we don't have any evidence of Homo erectus hunting Gigantopithecus. Right, because what we're going to need for that is we're going to need some some like postcranial fossils, maybe some arm bones or some leg bones, or some cut marks on them and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, barring that, you, you can't really make you can't even say that they were you know butchered or anything like this by Homo erectus. Um, but I think I think climate change probably played a, a bigger factor, right? Um, and even if you look at the, there's a much larger trend going on in ape evolution um, at this point in history, and for the you know, millions of years that preceded it. Because, you know, during the Miocene, from about 20 million years onward, uh, Europe and Asia was just, it was lousy with apes. There was apes everywhere. There's tons of different species, lots of different species diversity. But by the end of the Miocene, you know, the apes are gone from, from Europe and there's a major decrease in ape diversity in Asia as well. And so it's kind of like this continuing trend that the world is just not as hospitable uh, for the for apes in the places where they had traditionally lived and you can see this you know trying to try continue on to the Pleistocene because even in the Pleistocene we have orangutans that lived in China they were mainland orangutans um, but you know by the end of the Pleistocene they're gone as well and today the only orangutans we have are the ones that live in Borneo and Sumatra so they're much much further south so it seems like, you know, there's a general trend of, of loss of ape diversity combined with some climate change issues that, you know, this you can see how this really might have affected the distribution of like bamboo uh, across the landscape. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, all these kind of, the thing with the climatic, climatic change is it's, it's not just, we often think of it as one thing, but there's so many variables that come out from, from a change in climate that it's hard to, sit, to say that climate change wasn't a factor, right? 
So, um, you know, but, but who knows? Maybe if uh, Gigantopithecus had extended their range a little bit south, like, like uh, orangutans do, maybe they would have survived to d today. Who knows? But uh, as far as we know, you know, they might they probably didn't make it. Okay, Andrew, well, you say that, but is there any chance that uh, Gigantopithecus could still be alive today? Because I hear so many people talking about that, you know, and I must admit, it, it, that would actually be, that would be very cool. They were still oh, alive. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, no discussion of Gigantopithecus is complete without talking about Bigfoot. That's for sure. Oh, um, <laughs> you know, and so, so some Bigfoot enthusiasts, they think that, like, you, you know, you get your Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, that this might be a surviving ancestor of Gigantopithecus. Um, and it is a really cool idea, and I would really like it to be true. I think the problem is, is, well, we have some, you know, we have concrete evidence of Gigantopithecus existing. The evidence for, for Sasquatch isn't isn't really as good. Um, you know, we don't have any fossils of Sasquatch. We don't have any samples. Uh, you know, we do have, I'll show you these. I brought, um, we do have some casts of their feet, right? So this is, uh, this is okay. Okay. I never thought we'd be doing Bigfoot on this channel, but, <laughs> but I'm I'm open-minded. <laughs> yeah. So so what this is, it's it's a cast of supposedly like Bigfoot stepped in some mud, and somebody came and put some plaster in the, uh, yeah. you know, in the footprint. But I mean, if you take a look at it, very flat. It's very flat. We don't see like any like real kind of thing here. Ape feet. Also, the big toe is usually kind of sticks off to the side, right? Like that, right? Oh, yeah. It's the divergent big toe. So we don't see like a kind of, this is, doesn't look like an ape foot. It looks like an oversimplified human foot. And, mm. you know, this is kind of the best evidence we have for Bigfoot right now. Um, and so, most of the Bigfoot casts do look like that. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I got another one right here. I got another one right here for you. you can see, this is a, another one. And these are, you know, these are uh that, that's what we have for bigfoot uh i and again that's not even a cast of a fossil it's a cast of an impression and so you know you have to take a lot of people's word on this kind of stuff and it's it just it's no match for something like this yeah. you know for this box of teeth i have over here uh you know this is real hard evidence i like the idea i like the idea of bigfoot existing and I would love for it to be true because, like, then I could have like a North American primate to study. That would be really kind of cool. Um, but you know, I don't. Uh, I, I'm not convinced yet. You know, as I said, keep an open mind. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're gonna have to step up the level of evidence. But you know, that's one thing that's kind of cool about the Bigfoot community mm -hmm. is I, is I like them because they actually, uh, unlike other, you know. Um, you know, people are into cryptids and stuff like that. Uh, the Bigfoot people actually go out and look. They spend their weekends going through the woods looking for Bigfoot, you know, following leads. And so if it's out there, maybe they'll find them, you know. We do get that over here in Scotland with uh, Loch Ness monster spotters. Oh, yeah. They sit yeah. on the lakeside sometimes all year just looking, but... Uh, I'm afraid yeah, there's, there's no good seems, evidence for that. <laughs> yeah, Loch Ness seems a lot less like me. You got, you got a lake. You know, people have been looking at a lake for a long while. It's like, yeah, you should find them by now. Hey, Gigantopithecus, Bigfoot, you know, we get a lot of forest to comb through, right? Mm. So if we say a scale of probability, I'd say Bigfoot a little bit more probable than the Loch Ness Monster. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm not convinced of its existence quite yet. Okay, that was that was really great. This is such a fascinating subject. I know people must ask you about this creature a lot in the business you're in, and I know that every time I post about Gigantopithecus on my Evolution Soup Instagram, it sparks just a ton of conversation. Um, I guess all we can do now is to wait until, like you say, more fossils of these creatures uh, are found, right? Yeah, I mean, Gigantopithecus, I think, is one of the most fascinating creatures in all of you know prehistory really it's you know it's really quite remarkable because it's uh you know it's so big and it's really like outside um you know our understanding of, of animals that we have on on the planet today we don't really have anything like gigantopithecus and that's always really kind of neat i mean yeah that's what we could do is hopefully people will find more fossils or if you're really interested then uh you know become a paleontologist and go look for those fossils you know it'd be really nice if someone could start finding some uh some you know, some skeletal fossils, or maybe we can find the crania. Yeah, it's it's all the it's the post cranial the the stuff other than the skull that, that at the moment just doesn't seem to be extant. Isn't that right? 
Yeah, yeah. There's there's no postcranial. So postcranial just means like everything below the skull, except right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's there's none of that. But uh, you know, and if we had that, we begin to look at ideas of, of locomotion, right? And just to go back to the Bigfoot idea for for a little while is one thing. Bigfoot is a bipedal ape, right? And hmm. so sometimes people have made this claim about Gigantopithecus. I've heard this before in different places that Gigantopithecus was a bipedal ape, and we don't know that. We have no way of knowing that because, again, this is the mandible. If we had part of the uh, the skull that has the um, the, fr the, ma the foramen magnum, oh, yeah. uh, mag uh, you know, that would be able to tell us, you know, where the spine is positioned relative to the body. And that would give us some insight. Or if we found some leg bones, they'd be the ideal ones to be able to tell you about bipedalism. We'd be able to say that. But, you know, we could say that... Um, I would say, if I was to place some bets, that it's probably a quadrupedal ape. You know, it's big, yeah. hulking, massive ape. It's probably going around on all fours. But, it um, seems like it would be too big to walk on two feet, I would think. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But, uh, you know, we can't answer this question definitively. And, we don't and here's, know. And here's the, here, but, you know, there's some interesting stuff about bipedalism. Is we always used to kind of think of it as this one one kind of shot. That somewhere in our... our um, evolutionary history bipedalism evolved once and that was it and we all kind of emerged from that but you know there's more and more evidence growing these days that there was different experiments in bipedalism even earlier in the fossil record like um you know just what last week there's a paper that came out about this newly described species uh of ape this myocene ape from germany called uh danuvius guggenmosi um which seems to be functionally bipedal you know at uh, i think it's around 11 million years somewhere around there um, and then there's been a suggestion that Oreopithecus, which is a late period Miocene ape uh, from uh, Italy, that it might have had bipedalism as well, um, or at least a form of bipedalism, maybe something akin to like a gibbon where they kind of walk and hold their arms like this. Yes. And so, you know, um, it just makes the question of Gigantopithecus and how did it move even more fascinating because now it could be, there is a possibility it could have had bipedal you know, uh, form of locomotion. Um, that is a real possibility, which should be considered, but we can't really begin to answer that question until we find those those skeletal fossils, those leg bones, hip bones, things like that, that are really going to inform us about uh, the, you know, the functional uh, mode of locomotion. Yeah. That's it. And it'll be an exciting day when that happens, when a pelvis shows up, huh? Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and who knows, you know, the thing is, is like, these are such big animals that maybe people have actually already discovered them mm. and they didn't recognize they were a primate because they didn't expect a primate fossil to be that big. So maybe like, you know, in the basement of, uh, you know, somewhere in a museum in Beijing or something like that, there might be some Gigantopithecus fossils just sitting around, sitting waiting, around. Waiting, to be, <laughs> waiting to be rediscovered or diagnosed as a Gigantopithecus. That's a real possibility as well. Hopefully in our lifetime, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, as always, I will leave links to your social media in the description below. And I guess all that's left to say is thank you once again, Andrew. And uh, hopefully we will see you again on Evolution Soup in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, thank you very much.